Hey there everyone! So today's video is targeted specifically for new percussion instructors who may encounter students with no prior experience, no knowledge of how to move the stick or play a percussion instrument, and what you can do to set them up with the tools they need to pursue their marching band experience to the fullest. This can be kind of a hard video to make because all across the United States we have so many different approaches. So for this video I'll talk about what I decide to do most of the time and what I have found to be the most effective for my own students. Especially with new kids, I like to start with a more refined and maybe robotic or militant approach. So that way, as they're building their initial skill sets for the first time, they always have a reference either with their eyes or with their ears for what they can consider to be correct or incorrect. In the end, when we get to the world-class level, there's far more gray area between what is correct or incorrect. But I think starting out at a very, very young age, having a consistent reference makes it way, way easier for them to recognize whether they're doing the right things or doing the wrong things. So with every new student, I highlight three major topics that we'll be going over today. Number one is our height system. I like to identify this in three different ways for every single height that we use. So I will go through all of my different dynamics or volumes in which I play and talk about the ways in which I identify them. We'll talk about identifying them as dynamics first. I usually go through five different dynamics We'll start with piano, which would be our lowest dynamic, and it would look something like this. Our next dynamic would be mezzo piano, which would continue to increase, where we're looking for essentially the same percentage of increase at every single height. And so now we're at our mezzo piano dynamic. We increase the height again, and we're at mezzo forte. We increase the height again, and that brings us up to forte. And then we got one more where we go all the way up, and now we're at fortissimo. So obviously, if you're explaining that to a new kid for the first time, they may not attach to that at all. What does piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte mean to a student who has never done music before? Because of this, I also identify each of those heights in other ways. I will use an inch marker. So for piano, we would also call that three inches. Or for mezzo piano, we would call that six inches. For mezzo forte, we would call it nine. For forte, we would call it 12. And then for full out, we would call it 15. I also decided to do this in another way so that we can highlight the idea that the sticks are essentially moving up in equal amounts through every single dynamic, so we're more ready to express the full spectrum of our music. So the last one is an angle marker. I would call three inches or piano zero degrees because it is actually zero degrees. The stick is parallel with the ground. As we go to mezzo piano, I would increase that 22 and a half degrees and every single new height will be going up another 22 and a half. So mezzo piano is now 22 and a half degrees. We go to mezzo forte, which is also nine inches. We'll go up another 22 and a half degrees. This is 45 degrees. And if you turn sideways, you can see it's generally pretty close to actually being 45 degrees. And if kids can use this as a visual reference, it makes the middle area, that gray area of the dynamic range, a little bit easier to notice and control. Continuing to go up, we now have the forte height, or 12 inches. I call this 67 and a half degrees as we continue to bump the angle marker up. And then lastly, we have our full out, or our 15 inch, or fortissimo height, which I would call 90 degrees. And we can use it as an easy visual reference, because if you turn to the side, the stick is literally straight up and down. So now, we have a height system where every single dynamic is not just labeled by their dynamic and musical name, but it has an inch value, and it has an angle value included with it. So that way kids, as they express all of these different dynamics up and down the drum, they are able to look at the stick and ask themselves whether they're actually achieving those volumes the way that they were originally taught, or whether they're misinterpreting the way that those dynamics and sounds are reaching their ear. So now we got number two, which is our stroke types, or stroke motion. And this is really just important to make sure that the kids understand that there are situations in which they have to move the stick different ways. And so I really only talk about three basic stroke types. First one is what I would call the rebound stroke, or the full stroke. So I will start at a 12 inch height, I'll prep the stick up to 67 and a half degrees, 12 inches, or forte. 
and I will use the analogy of the idea of driving behind a car. Imagine that you're driving behind a car and you decide to punch the gas pedal and the brake pedal at the exact same time. If you're familiar with the way that a car works, you would know that if you're in the middle of driving and you do that, your engine is likely to explode as you're revving the engine up, as you're also applying the brakes at the same time, and your car freaks out and has no idea what to do. This analogy is very helpful for our hands as well because we never want to decide to initiate or engage our gas pedal at the same time that we initiate or engage our brake pedal. So with the rebound stroke, we'll start at 12 inches or forte and we will initiate just the gas pedal. We'll think about the idea of being behind a car and we'll punch the gas really quickly once and then let go of it and that's all we gotta do. And so within this rebound stroke, there is no stoppage. There is no break at all. It is just a quick initiation of the gas and the natural movement of the stick allows it to come right back up to where it started. That's stroke one. Stroke two is going to be our downstroke or a weighted stroke. And we use these types of strokes whenever we want to stop the stick at a lower height than the one at which we originally played. One of the biggest mistakes that I see within the rebound stroke to downstroke difference is that there is a very clearly different sound between the two of them, and that is something that I don't want. So in order to achieve the same sound with a downstroke or a weighted stroke as we do with a rebound stroke, we have to think about the way that we decide to initiate that gas pedal and when we decide to finally pull on the brakes. So just like a rebound stroke, I'll initiate the stick, lift it to 12, I'll punch the gas pedal the exact same way that I did with the rebound stroke, so it starts its movement downwards, and only after it has finally made contact with the head do I think about engaging any brakes at all or trying to hold the hand down or keep it firm enough to stay in spot. A lot of the times, new students will start to engage that brake pedal too early when they're still on the way down and they'll hesitate and not make full contact with the drum and get that full resonant sound from the stick the same way the rebound stroke would. And so you can hear a clear difference between the rebound stroke energy and the tighter and less controlled downstroke energy. And so in this case, we want to make sure that we are initiating our stroke the exact same way as we did with a rebound stroke and only engaging the brakes after we've made contact with the head so that way we can achieve a synonymous sound between rebound stroke and downstroke. And obviously, that is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Even as someone who's been drumming for a very, very long time, you can still hear tons of tiny little changes and nuances between my true rebound stroke and my true downstroke. So that's a skill set that everybody has to work on all the time. We've now identified two strokes, rebound stroke and then downstroke or weighted stroke. And the only last stroke that I talk about is our upstroke or a snap stroke, sometimes I like to call it. And this is specifically for when we start at a lower height and our intention is to prep our stick to get ready to play at a bigger height afterwards. And so in this case, we use the exact same analogy that we use in our rebound stroke and our downstroke. We have our gas pedal and our brake pedal. We'll initiate the stick to three inches now because we start at a low height. And we have to punch the gas pretty hard and really fast because we only have a tiny bit of distance. But the intention is to still not touch the brakes at all. Right, we want the stick to return to a higher point afterwards in order for us to upstroke or bring the stick back up. And so it looks something like a quick punch of the gas pedal and then a release. This will obviously have a clearly different sound than our rebound stroke and our downstroke just because of the height that we were playing. If I decided to play an upstroke at 12, it should sound the same as a rebound stroke at 12 or a downstroke at 12. Often we don't decide to do that though. So with all three of those things identified, let's recap really quickly. We now have our height system, number one, where we go through all of our dynamics, piano, mezzo piano, mezzo forte, forte, fortissimo, or our inch markers or our angle markers for all those heights. And then we have our stroke system, or our stroke types, or stroke motion, where we talk about the difference between a rebound stroke, where we punch the gas and let it come back up, our downstroke, where we punch the gas we let it strike the head in the same way and then engage the brakes from the wrist or keep the hand firm enough to hold the stick down. And then the upstroke, where we prep the stick at a low height, we punch the gas just like we did before, maybe with even more energy so that we can get the stick to move faster and then allow it to come back up without hitting the brakes. So with these two skill sets, the height system and the stroke types, 
they should now be in a great position to work through our basic eights or rebound strokes exercise, accent tap, and identify whether they are achieving these things correctly or incorrectly, whether it's the stick motion or the volume that they are achieving with each of the notes that they play. Topic three, I would say, is the most important for when they finally get onto the football field and they have to actively carry the drum and play all of these things while moving at the same time. And our third topic will be feet timing. There's so many ways to talk about feet timing, and one of the first ones that I decide to do is called moving eighth note. This exercise is where we literally just mark time the entire time. We move our feet left, right, left, right with every single quarter note. And in our head, we're counting out a full bar of eighth notes. And so we could say it out loud and go, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. And for a brand new student, our goal will be to identify how the feet line up with each of those eighth note partials and learning how to play just one note on each of those partials. So it moves down the line every single time we get to a new bar. So the exercise will start to sound something like this, where in bar one, we just play that very first eighth note partial. And we go, one, two, three, four. Or if I'm counting all of the eighth notes, one and two and three and four and. In the next bar, we can do it either off the same hand or off the opposite hand. We just move that over one partial. So now we're on the and of one. So now we have one and two and three and four and. And as you continue to add bars, all you're doing is shifting that note further and further down the line. So that way students get comfortable with moving their feet consistently, counting the bass rhythm, the macro rhythm in their head or out loud, and then identifying where that one note is supposed to go on top of that giant grid. So the whole exercise would look something like this. One, two, ready, go. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two, three and four and one and two and three and four. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one, two and three and four and one. So this we can now do at tons of different heights. We can add more notes into that exercise or take those notes back out and work on our height structure, our different stroke types, and our general feet timing with just these three basic ideas that we've identified so far. I personally find that when kids understand all three of these concepts and can articulate them back to me with their mouths, meaning that they can actually have a discussion with me about the nature of these three topics and what they should be looking for at each of those heights, they end up more consistently achieving these things at home and being able to identify and recognize when those things are maybe less comfortable for them than another student or far more comfortable for them than another student. Hopefully the way that I explained these concepts was helpful to you and helped you articulate it in a slightly different way um, or at least provided a structure for you to identify what the kids need to understand in order to move forward and to pursue deeper and more intricate and nuanced aspects of the marching band activity. If you have any questions, feel free to message me. Thank you so much for subscribing to my Patreon. You guys are all wonderful people, my beautiful patrons, and I would love to have discussion and more talk about some of the ideas that you have or some of the things that you decide to identify in your own practice when you have brand new students with absolutely no experience whatsoever. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Thank you so much.